Hello, everyone, and welcome to BuzzFeed University's 13 Things We Learned in 2013 that you can use in 2014. I'm Regis Kortmanch, the Director of Learning at BuzzFeed, and we're excited to share with you the lessons we took away from this long and productive year. A few quick things before we get started. First, we want to hear what you have to say, so if you have a question, please submit it to all panelists in the chat section, or you can write to BuzzFeedU on Twitter and use the, ha use the hashtag BFU. We are recording today's event, and we'll share the recording with everyone who registered. Also, in true BuzzFeed spirit, you'll be receiving a summary post directly afterwards and a survey which will make future events as useful to you as possible. To stay informed about what's happening at BuzzFeedU, please follow us on Twitter or send a note to BuzzFeedU at BuzzFeed.com. We have our A team here for you today, the first of which being Jen Wallisoff. Jen has been at BuzzFeed since 2010, starting as our first account manager. She has managed some of BuzzFeed's most strategic accounts, including GE, Virgin Mobile, and Geico. Jen is now the Director of Partner Education and Development, leading BuzzFeed University, which consists of virtual and live learning events, one of which you're a part of today, on the art and science of content creation and social advertising. We also have Jack Shepard here with us today. Jack has been at BuzzFeed since 2008 and serves as the website's editorial director and justly titled Beastmaster <laughs> since he runs our animals vertical. He's responsible for some of BuzzFeed's all-time biggest posts, including 21 pictures that will restore your faith in humanity and the 50 cutest things that ever happened. <laughs> Finally, Matt Sapira is BuzzFeed's director of special projects. Sounds dubious. He's focusing on pop culture and viral content. Matt also joined BuzzFeed in 2008 and has written over 6,500 posts, with some of his most successful being 13 Simple Steps to Get You Through a Rough Day, which I referenced last week, and the 45 Most Powerful Images of 2011. Matt was also featured in Adweek's list of 50 people who make the machinery of media and loves all things Britney Spears and Ryan Gosling, as I'm sure you'll see today. For our first unofficial lesson, however, we asked everyone who registered whether they were a dog or a cat person. Any guesses in the room here to what percentage voted for each? And I'll give the people on the line a second to think about that, too. 70 dogs. Ooh, 70 dogs we have. 60% cats. 60 cats. 60 dogs. 100% cats. All right. <laughs> um, Jack's a little biased. So we learned that the majority of you on the call today are actually dog lovers. 73% wow. of you, in fact. Only 27% chose cats. Personally, I am allergic to both, but I skew towards dogs as well, so sorry about that, Jack. Um, for our first official lesson, however, let me pass the mic to Jen Wallace. Jen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Regis. All right, well, first, I'll do a quick hello. Hi, everyone. I'm Jen Wallace, and we're going to jump right into the learning. Okay. Let me just jump right in. Yep, so we were. Perfect. We're all ready. All right. Well, lesson number one, you see it right here. What spreads depends on the platform. Now, I know you're not able to answer where I can hear you, but at your desk or watching on your mobile phone, play along with me. Where do you think this post, let me go to it, took off on the social web? 28 magical beauty products that are pure genius. Or what about this one? 24 things single people are tired of hearing. Maybe Facebook or Pinterest. Well, let's dig deeper into why. So what we've learned from the millions of BuzzFeed posts and across our partner network of over 500 million uniques is that content performs differently on different platforms. Go figure. Facebook, where your family and friends are, is about personal connections. Content about identity, whether it's about you or a loved one, is more likely to spread on Facebook. We want to share with those who are interested in what we're interested in, or share things we know will be interesting to others. Twitter is where you've built a like-minded community, and most of whom you don't know personally. The content that spreads here is informative, you know, the news, the latest tech gadget. You know, why don't you check back to the latest thing you posted on Twitter? Did it make you feel smart or clever? Well, we share things that make us feel intelligent and in the know. Pinterest is a digital bulletin board of things that inspire us, 
content about food recipes that we grab later, clothes that we just have to have, are all part of the Pinterest sphere. The type of content that spreads on Pinterest is part of who we aspire to be. And interestingly, these rules apply to both editorial content and advertising content. Because at BuzzFeed, we think about advertising the same way we think about editorial. Both ad advertising and editorial have the same goal, to engage the reader. So now we understand that different content performs differently depending on the platform. So next we want to understand how does traffic move across these platforms. So on the left, we have a graph of Facebook, and on the right, Pinterest. The y-axis displays views, and the x-axis shows the number of days the post has been live on that given platform. A post on Facebook typically lasts about seven days. And that's seven days. That's a long time for something to last. So in order for it to have this seven-day life cycle, it must be good content. The content we know that's liked, shared, commented on. And for Pinterest, it's different. It has a long tail effect. You can see Pinterest activity weeks after posting. It makes its rounds through what they call repinning, through your network, to my network, to my friend's network. And although Twitter isn't shown here on this slide, its lifespan is less than half of Facebook. We see about a 24 to 48 hour uh, life cycle of a post. And that's really what 140 characters is meant to deliver. It's a different platform. So how do we put this into practice on BuzzFeed? Well, here's a recent example. Thanksgiving was a few weeks ago. And on Pinterest, we started seeding our Thanksgiving content an entire month before Thanksgiving. So why is that? Because that seems a bit strange, so you may think. But it's because of this long tail effect in delivering traffic on Pinterest. And a few days before the holiday, we posted this content to Facebook. So once you understand how these platforms perform, you can tailor your organic posting strategy more effectively. And at the core of every piece of shareable content is an emotion, that unique quality that makes us all human. So we learned that different pieces of content perform differently on different platforms, say that three times fast, <laughs> and understanding the fundamental differences of performance allows you to create your strategy for posting content which brings us into our next lesson. Lesson number two, social video creation requires thinking differently. Taking a TV asset and putting it on a portal was not a successful strategy 10 years ago. And today, taking a TV asset and importing to social and mobile is not a successful strategy either. So why is that? Well, it's because social video works differently than TV and requires a different way of thinking. A 60-second spot that airs during prime time is no longer the way to reach a mass audience of young adults. Social video is lightweight, less expensive, accessible, and much quicker to produce. In just 12 months, Zay Frank, our EVP of video, and his team have created almost 900 videos. It, it baffles my mind, which have generated over 75 million video views per month. And of these, more than 160 have had views of more than 1 million. So when are people watching these social videos? Well, this may surprise you, but it's during prime time. Broadcast programming now has to compete with social video because viewers are multitasking. We're catching up on Facebook, tweeting with our friends, reading news and entertainment, and sometimes interacting with the TV. And for video to compete, it must draw emotion immediately and be compelling. So while TV requires a captive audience, social video is where you and I are in control. We can watch what we want, when we want it, and therefore the emotional invest investment is greater. So in the past year, we've worked with brands to find the human element of their message. We've seen great success with clients like Virgin Mobile, GE, and YouTube, all of which are shown here. And only two weeks ago, we launched a video narrated by Zay for Purina Tidy Cats. And within 24 hours of it being live, it received over 1 million views. And now it has over 3 million views. So the lesson is if someone can see themselves or a friend through the content, it is more likely to be shared. And the other lesson for brand marketers is to be brave. Because the cost of producing a 30-second or 60-second spot for social video is so much more efficient than TV. 
you know, you can experiment with various formats and topics and deliver powerful, successful results like Purina did with the 3 million views and growing. So, you know, YouTube is today's broadcast model as more people watch, consume, and engage with video online. In 2013, we learned social video is a different way of thinking with the goal to engage and experiment. Okay, lesson number three. Mobile is the first screen. Well, this shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone on this call. For years we've been saying, this is the year of mobile. Well, 2013 actually was. And why is that? Well, what has radically shifted is the way media is being consumed. So where is your mobile phone right now? Next to you, in your pocket, I have mine right here. <laughs> and as humans, we are biologically trained for the need to feel connected. We're more likely to lose our wallets because we only use them to pay for something or when we have to show our ID. But our phones, we have them with us at all times. In fact, 80% of young adults sleep with their phones on their nightstand. And I'm not kidding, that's true. <laughs> Mobile is where content is seen first. Mobile is the first screen. People spend more time on mobile than they do on their desktop. Because of the great screen quality and easy access of mobile, well, we've added a new behavior. So some of you may have heard this. First, we had the Board at Work network, where you'd search the web for interesting content during the workday to the board in line network, where you're sharing, texting, tweeting, where, and, you know, whenever you have a minute, because your phone is always with you. And because the mobile experience is so great, those board at work or board in line are doing much more with their phone. They seek news and quality reporting. I know every morning, waiting for the subway, I'm on my phone. Or I'm at dinner, I'm waiting for a friend, I'm on my phone. And the funny thing is, I'm never using it to talk. I'm either consuming or sharing content or checking in on my social sites. And you know, I'm not alone. There are hundreds of millions of people just like me. In 2013, we learned social is mobile. And in order to be social, in order for your brand to matter, to be a part of the conversation, brands need to be on mobile. So Comscore released a study that shows by April of 2014, only four months from now, 80% of the U.S. population will own a smartphone. Content is being consumed readily on these smartphones, whether on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, or BuzzFeed. And as a brand, you can't expect the consumer to find you. You've got to be where they are. So let's talk about numbers. Let's get into the stats. So 50% of our readership is on mobile, and it continues to grow. And of these people, 60% are between the age of 18 to 34, the young adults. And get this, on average, people spend almost two and a half hours every day on their mobile phone. We also see higher share rates on mobile and click-through rates that are double that of desktop. So in conclusion, we learned this is the year of mobile, and mobile is the first screen. Lesson number four, it's not what you do, it's why you do it. When creating content for a brand, it's important to consider two things, the brand's attributes and aspirations. So what do I mean by this? Well, attributes are the specific features of your brand's product, and aspirations are what the brand stands for, the mission or belief of the brand. So here are two examples. The first, Starbucks. Delicious coffee, conveniently located in an assortment of flavors. But why is it so successful? Because Starbucks believes in bringing you and me together, a community, a feeling much bigger than coffee. And you may remember that they were the first to introduce Wi-Fi in their coffee shops, and it was to inspire a social experience. So shown here on the right are a few tweets about their red cup. I'm sure you've seen this red cup all around, and you know what? People can't stop talking about it. And the coffee is the same, so why is there so much chatter and conversation? Well, it's that feeling of joy, the holiday spirit that brings people together. It's combining the human, ele uh, the human element and the emotion of joy with their Starbucks product. All right, so let's take a look at another example. Tom's, a shoe company. So their product attributes are lightweight, easy to wear, and affordable. But people don't only buy Tom's for their attributes. They know that by purchasing Tom's, they are doing something good for a child. 
For every purchase you and I make, Tom's provides a pair of shoes to a child in need. Now that's something we can get behind and talk about. It's the why, the aspirations that make people proud to wear Tom's. By purchasing Tom's, they feel good about themselves because they know they are doing good for someone else. And people like to talk about things that make them feel good and hope to inspire others to do the same. In a recent TED Talk by Simon Sinek, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. I believe it has almost 12 million views. He says, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So let me say that again. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So when you think of a brand, it's important to think about what the brand stands for. This year, with the proliferation of social content, brands have discovered a whole new way to connect to the consumer. They create content so compelling, so relevant to the brand aspirations, that people want to share it. So this year, we, we saw the importance of brands understanding their why to create great content that gets shared. Lesson number five, a good content strategy inspires conversation. So an important way to inspire your consumer is to share conversations and to get them talking about your brand in either the digital world, whether it's on Facebook or Twitter, or the real world. Your strategy should have multiple objectives. It can have a long shelf life and it can capture the moment. And it's the brands that can tap into both the evergreen and real-time strategies that are the most successful. There are certain tenets about your brand that remain the same. Your core value, brand identity, beliefs, and like we talked about, aspirations. And programs that promote their core values should be evergreen or always on. And then there are times when you want to take advantage of real-time events in real time. And so your brand's core values don't change, but you're leveraging the, cult the cultural zeitgeist and connecting your brand to it. No other medium allows you to leverage real-time events like social. And it's designed to do just that. I mentioned when I first started talking that our innate human characteristic is to want to connect with other people. And the technology of social really allows us to do that to share and connect, but at multiples we never imagined before Facebook and Twitter existed. And crazy enough, it's only been nine years. So imagine what's next. So let's take a look at both of these concepts in more detail. So for Volkswagen, the focus of their brand campaign was their messaging, come on, get happy, while tuning in to cultural moments. So when the Super Bowl had a 50-50 chance of either the San Francisco 49ers winning or the Baltimore Ravens, I hear you guys in the out there yelling for your favorite team, <laughs> well, we implemented a strategy of what we like to call planned spontaneity. We created two posts before the game that gave the losing team reasons to still be happy. And once that final score was announced and the Ravens won, well, our, our team was ready to publish the post that read, so your team lost, but here are 10 reasons why it's still awesome to be a San Francisco fan. <laughs> a seamless execution, and the results were a marketer's dream. But you know, the Super Bowl is only an event that happens once a year. So Volkswagen created a foundation of posts that spoke to their core beliefs and their aspirations. So posts like 15 gifts to share with your friend that's having a rough day, and nine songs that will turn your frown the other way around. So savvy marketers are realizing that they can create Super Bowl-like hits every day, not just on the Super Bowl. We learned a successful content strategy is experimenting and diversifying content to inspire your consumer's experience and to share meaningful conversations, which lends itself into lesson number six. Great content is an art and science. So the art or the content, whether it's posts or videos, is an important asset in generating an emotional response, a connection between your brand and the consumer. The science is the distribution and the technology that drives performance. At BuzzFeed, we create an average of five posts per program. Each post is different and tailored to a different audience. So for example, let's say your brand is trying to reach skiers. Your post may be unbelievably gorgeous mountains to go skiing on. So we use our optimization tool called Flexible Promotion to create multiple variations of that headline. We A, B, C test headlines, as you see here, to increase click-through rate and performance for that specific post. 
And what's interesting is we do this across all five or more posts. And as the headlines, they may not directly reflect skiing. It really depends on the aspirations of the brand, as we talked about earlier. So maybe 10 of the most beautiful mountains in the world. Our proprietary content management system starves the posts that aren't performing and promotes the ones that are. The consumer rules and the best content stays on top. Another way we optimize to create the best experience for our users is understanding how they share content. So we've studied the varied behavior of users coming to BuzzFeed depending on where they came from. So, for example, if a user comes to BuzzFeed through Pinterest, we've learned that they want to continue sharing via Pinterest. So as you can see here on the left, we have a post and there's the Facebook button right there on the share bar right up front. But when we see somebody coming in through Pinterest, it dynamically changes within our system and the Pinterest button shows up, for, um, up front. And so we experiment to all the time. And today's solutions will not be tomorrow's. We've learned from the beginning to not rely on one iteration, but to test many. And as the results show, it's a mix of art and science. By varying up the creative, you can be sure your message will resonate. And with the science of optimization, you can capitalize on what's working best. And speaking about what's working best, we have, oh my gosh, we have Jack and Matt, the best of the best, from the editorial side to share their compelling insights from 2013. All right. Woo, Jen. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> um, all right, let's see if we can show our faces here. <laughs> Unfortunately, including Matt's face, I'm sorry. Here, here's Matt. I'm Jack, and this is Matt. Um, can you guys see us? Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. All right, now, Regis, how do we put it back? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ah, there we go. Um, so, hi, I'm, I'm Jack. I'm the, the editorial director here at BuzzFeed, and, and with me is Matt Stapira. Um, Matt, do you have a title? Yeah, Jack, I have a title. I am the uh, director of a uh, creative project. <laughs> um, Matt, Matt, Matt basically just wandered into the office about five years ago, and no one has had the heart to uh, to ask him what he really does. <laughs> Jack, I've um, also been thinking about that for literally weeks. Yeah, I've, been, <laughs> I've been working on that. Um, man, you really got the last laugh on that, didn't you, Matt? Um, so I'm at our, our lesson number seven is 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 that a list is just a scaffolding for a story. Um, and, and one of the questions that people have, have started asking us uh, in editorial a whole lot this past year goes something like, um, when are people going to get tired of listicles? Um, and I think this is basically a really good question. And the fact is that we are, we're constantly experimenting with different ways of framing and presenting content. Uh, but on some level, I think that the question does miss kind of an important po point about what exactly a list is and what its potential is as a format. And, and I think that part of that misconception is kind of contained in the word listicle itself, which is which is kind of dismissive of this kind of incredibly sort of rich form. Um, and, and it also seems to imply that every piece of content that has a number in front of it uh, was created equal, which is not really the way that we, we think about lists at BuzzFeed. Uh, for us, a, a list is just a tool for organizing information. And, and kind of depending on what you're trying to do, the difference between, say, a really uh, really great list, um, like this, this fantastic uh, list here, and, and, and let's say a really incredibly important list, uh, is, is a, a fairly massive difference. And, and it turns out that kind of getting it right, depending on what you want to do, is, is an awful lot trickier than it looks. Um, so, so that being said, it's probably not a great idea to, to, to overthink these things too much. Uh, there's a reason why lists have been such a big hit throughout history and why they've worked so well for BuzzFeed in the last year. For one thing, lists, a good list is easy to scan. Um, uh, you're, not, you're not messing with people's expectations with a list. Everyone knows exactly what to expect when they click on a list, and, and you don't want that experience to be a disappointment. Um, and so to put it even more simply, the Internet is a chaotic and frightening place, and, and there's something that's incredibly satisfying about having things organized for you. Um, and by the same token, there's something that's universally horrifying about things that are organized badly. Um, and if you're anything like me, uh, don't look at this slide too long because it will drive you nuts. Um, but, but, but the really important thing about lists is that they can provide a dynamic tool for organizing information or for telling a story. And, and it's actually misleading to think of them the way that I think a lot of content creators sometimes do, uh, which is as an arbitrary grouping of similar things. 
and this is my this is my example of, of a bad list that's just an it's not a terrible list, but it's just <laughs> it's an arbitrary <laughs> group of things. And it's sort of it, that that kind of thing is totally fine and it's it's one it's one thing you can do and this is sort of sometimes it's even a very necessary thing. This is a an, an extremely important uh, list that I put together of hundred and nine cats and sweaters, which is it, exactly what that is. It's, it just keeps on going and going. More cats and sweaters, which is great. Um, but a list can be so much more, uh, and, and really, really great lists have been an extremely popular way of engaging with content for way longer than BuzzFeed has been around, and the reason for that is that lists are a natural way for our brains to process information, which means that any information can be presented as a list. What matters isn't the list itself, uh, but whether it's got good stuff in it, and, and the point that I make to editors over and over at BuzzFeed uh, is that a list should just be scaffolding for a story. Uh, exactly what story you choose to tell using a list as a frame uh, is both the hard part and the good part. Um, and so lesson number eight is that there is a reason why animals rule the internet. Um, and so one of the things that we've learned at BuzzFeed over the years is that when you write about people at their best, uh, people kind of rising above themselves in extraordinary circumstances, uh, those posts tend to be some of the most shared, shared pieces of content out of almost anything that we do. Uh, and I hope this doesn't sound too pessimistic, but it's, it's a well-known fact that, that everything sucks pretty much all of the time. Uh, uh, so when we do encounter those brief, wonderful moments when the, when the human spirit kind of triumphs despite overwhelming odds, we have a powerful desire to share that experience with others. Um, so what does this have to do with animals? Um, uh, this, is, this is maybe partially because I'm also the animals editor here at BuzzFeed, and partially because I'm one of these people who is who's just way into cats, which is apparently not a feeling that is shared by most people. <laughs> attending this, um, uh, but, but I do think that our empathy for animals is one of the purest examples of people at their absolute best that you can find. Uh, and the feeling that you get when you come across a serious, like, category five cute animal is, is powerful and wonderful and shareable for a reason, uh, and it's because animals bring out the best in us. Uh, this year we really doubled down on making our animal section the most important virtual kitten playground uh, in the world, and I think it was well worth the effort. Here's, here's a kind of a, a very quick look at one of my, my favorite animal posts from the year to give you a sense of what we're, what we're working with here. This is a, this is a post I did called uh, The 30 Greatest Moments in the History of Cute. And we sort of went, went really sort of scientifically and systematically through the history of cute um, and really isolated those moments that were most important, such as this, this cat's uh, intrepid quest to, to boop a horse. Boop is a, a term of art uh, in the industry, in the cute industry. Um, and uh, and then here are some other ones, which I'll, I'll let you peruse for yourself. Cats and babies, good combo. Um, lesson number nine is that some celebrities have figured out a network instead of a broadcast model. Um, and I will explain what that means. Um, a, a really useful distinction that's always been extremely important to BuzzFeed is between something that's actually viral uh, and something that's just popular. So an inane tweet from Kim Kardashian might get hundreds of thousands of views, for instance. Uh, but that's only because she already has tens of millions of followers. Uh, so this is what we would call the broadcast model. It's basically one person or media entity with a whole lot of daily homepage visitors who's just kind of broadcasting a message to those visitors and not really thinking beyond that. Um, so at BuzzFeed, we've always been focused on the network model, uh, which is thinking about our homepage as a jumping off point for content that is highly shareable through the network. Um, so, so when something gets, gets a ton of clicks and homepage views on, on BuzzFeed but a low rate of sharing, uh, we would often consider that a failure. Um, and the good news is that this, like, this, this approach to content really keeps you honest uh, and the only effective way of getting a lot of people to share something uh, uh, once, once they're on the page is, is to kind of make something that's, that's, that's naturally incredibly engaging. Uh, and so not, not to pick on Kim Kardashian here, but that's not really her thing. <laughs> um, thanks, Matt. Um, but I, I do think that there are beginning to be some celebrities, and it's really interesting, who have, who have totally figured this out. And I think probably the best example of that uh, right now is George Takei. Uh, yeah, so this is Matt now. And George Takei is um, one of the most popular celebrities on Facebook. He has over 5 million fans. and, and, and and an incredibly rabid fan base. I like to think of the way that he does Facebook as the BuzzFeed model, whereas he posts, you know, a, a funny picture uh, half the time, and then the other half the time he posts more serious things. And so this year we teamed up with George to combine the two. Um, we were outside of the Supreme Court this year, and we asked a bunch of young people to write down why they believed in traditional marriage. And then we had George um, come in and write his own response back. 
um, which kind of turned out to be really hilarious. Um, basically, George Takei's technique of combining funny, shareable content with a powerfully engaging social message about the causes that matter to him is an awesome new model for celebrities to relate to their fans. Um, lesson number 10. Um, the secret to covering an event is finding the right moment. Um, the way that we do BuzzFeed is we go on Facebook and Twitter and we really see what people are talking about during an event. We isolate that big moment and we really uh, swarm that story and uh, kind of highlight those moments. And one of the best examples of that this year was the VMAs. And, um, you know, we all kind of felt like this after we uh, watched Miley Cyrus perform. Um, and unfortunately, I have to say this, this, this wasn't actually the reaction to Miley Cyrus. It was to Lady Gaga, but still it was hilarious. And um, this picture kind of summed up the entire night, and we kind of just swarmed the story on Miley and did as much as we could about Miley Cyrus. You know, this, what Rihanna thought about Miley Cyrus, um, people that uh, Miley Cyrus looked like. You know, we saw people on Twitter saying like, oh my God. Miley Cyrus looks like Angelica from Rugrats, and, you know, we kind of made that happen for people and put the two pictures side by side. Um, and then personally, um, oh, actually, no, this is an actual favorite, Miley Cyrus working on famous paintings. We have an illustrator here um, who uh, made these awesome and hilarious paintings, which you have to check out if you haven't seen these. But now the most important point is that um, Miley Cyrus' VMA performance was a failure because you don't try to imitate the queen. <laughs> um, <I'm biased>. <laughs> <laughs> little yeah. biased, but not really. Thank you, Matt. Um, so lesson number 11 is, is that, that age, your age and your location are two of the biggest factors in identity. Um, and I think that kind of a corollary to that is that identity in many ways is the secret to sharing across all content types. Um, so the internet has changed in, in wonderful and fascinating and sometimes kind of terrifying ways uh, in the five years that since Matt and I started at BuzzFeed. Uh, but one thing that has fundamentally stayed the same is that people still really like things that are about themselves. Uh, so it, it's not an accident uh, that the most common and popular way for people to relate to something on the internet right now is the like button. Uh, and like can mean a number of different things. But I, I think that all of those things are tied up with identity in some way, with how you self-identify, with what causes or postures you want to align yourself with, and, and most importantly, with how you want other people to see you. So like, like can mean, uh, this is something that I believe in. Uh, like can mean, look how smart I am. Uh, and like can mean, this is who I am. Um, but I think maybe a little bit surprisingly, uh, some of our biggest hits this year have been the kind of like that means, oh my God, I am so freaking old. <laughs> um, and maybe, maybe somewhat less surprisingly, the kind of like that means this is where I'm from. Yeah, so location-based identity posts have kind of been huge this year. People love to talk about where they're from or where they came from, and they love to share that. Uh, they love to say, you know, um, I'm the way I am because I grew up in this place. Um, and some examples of that are, these are just posts about New Jersey that we did this year. It's just endless. You know, you can go from something so small as being from Cape May, New Jersey to, you know, the entire South Jersey um, area. Um, the overall thing to take away from this is that thinking about identity is a great place to start if you want to make something that people share. And then if you want to narrow that down even further, you should think about age and location. So lesson number 12, you haven't reported a story until you've looked at every angle. Um, one of the things we were obsessed with this year at BuzzFeed was Orange is the New, Be or Orange is the New Black. Um, we were all passionate about the show, and we know from your long experience that when you write stories about things that you genuinely love, they will resonate with readers. Um, what was great about our coverage is that we kind of swarm a story, like I was saying earlier, and we go from, uh, you know, the more serious side of the story. Um, we broke the, the news that Laura Prepon was leaving Orange is the New Black. Sorry for a spoiler. Um, it's not really a spoiler, though, just so you know. Believe me, I, like, went into it. And, uh, you know, how actress Laverne Cox broke the trans glass ceiling. And then, so that was the serious side, and then we kind of went at it from the funny side, you know. Um, the characters of Orange is the New Black as cats, um, and my personal favorite, Officer Bennett, who is great. Um, 
then this really cool thing happened. Um, Lost Remote said, uh, you know, that we helped accelerate the success of the show, and uh, I'll just read this quote. Since the show's launch, BuzzFeed has published over 25 stories about black, and over 1 million visits to these stories came from social, proving how important their opinions on the show were to discussions on Facebook, Twitter, and more. Um, so basically, our enthusiasm for Orange is the New Black was totally contagious. Uh, yeah, and I think uh, on a more serious note, I think it's, it's one of our, our, our big goals at BuzzFeed uh, this year to be both a, a news and entertainment company and sort of, you know, taking that taking that lesson uh, that Matt is talking about in relation to something like Orange is the New Black or kind of a pop culture thing that's taking off, you can also apply that to something serious like long form or something like, uh, or something like news or serious news. And, and I think thinking about it as one example, kind of covering every aspect of, of Sochi in advance of the upcoming Olympics in Russia uh, helped us to kind of focus in on what I think is going to continue to be one of the biggest issues surrounding that event um, from a news perspective, which is Russia's treatment of gay people. Um. Our last lesson of the day, lesson number 13, is actually the most important lesson, so everyone please listen up. Listen very closely to this one. This is all very, very important. Um, lesson number 13, Ryan Gosling is still really, really... Um, I'll add another one, really ridiculously good looking. Um, you know, this year we found out that, you know, he was really good looking when he took off his shirt. Pumping gas, you know, who would have thought the simple act of pumping gas? Hot, like what? You know, that time that he went into cereal, you know, you know, he was so defiant, but still, it was, you know, pretty hot. Um, one more, because you know what, this is fun for me. Um, when he laughs, you know, this is supposed to be an animated gift, but just imagine it. You know, you can like kind of see it from the look on his face in this right now. Um, it's, you know, it's really nice. Um, but really what I want to say about this is um, there's this group of celebrities that I like to call the untouchables. Um, they're the group of celebrities that have really passionate, rabid fan bases. Uh, some examples of these celebrities are uh, Ryan Gosling, George Takei, One Direction, Rihanna, Britney Spears, uh, Jennifer Lawrence. Uh, and um, what we do is we kind of play to these fan bases and create content for them. And uh, once you tap into the enthusiasm for the untouchables, you can post almost anything. Even something that might seem boring in, in another context becomes transcendent, um, like Ryan Gosling holding a water bottle. Um, which was a pretty big hit for us this year. Um, yeah, and I'll just I'll, I'll just add to that, that 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 I think you know when you are really really genuinely enthusiastic about something, as as I think Matt has demonstrated that he is about one Ryan Gosling today, uh, that 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 sort of enthusiasm really resonates with people, and in a, they can kind of feel that, and that and that experience of kind of, of feeling someone else's enthusiasm for something is, is a really, really great way to, to encourage people to share something, and that sort of kind of comes through in people wanting to share the content. And I think that's all, that's all from us. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for sharing your lessons, guys. And we have several questions um, from our listeners already, and I guess I'll start with this one um, for Jack and Matt. What's coming in 2014? I hear a lot about expansion plans. Um, I th well, I think a couple of things. One, one of the things that I'm I'm really thinking about a lot, uh, as as far as what we're going to do in editorial in 2014, is I want to work really hard on kind of diversifying our content types. Um, I talked a little bit about lists, but I can't, I think that we really want to work hard on on doing lots of different kinds of content and experimenting with different frames for content and and kind of kind of pushing that forward and always and not getting complacent in in kind of doing the same thing. Um, and, and as well as that, I, think I want to diversify kind of the platforms that we're focused on. And, and Jen talked a little bit about platforms, about Facebook and Pinterest, and I think there are going to be more things that we're going to be think thinking about. And then kind of part of that is, is our, our sort of our plans for, for expanding globally. And we've, we've done a little bit of work so far. We've launched BuzzFeed in, uh, in Portuguese and in Spanish and in French, and we launched a BuzzFeed Australia um, this year that's kind of, that's kind of coming up. There's an office in Australia. Um, and so we're kind of we're, we're experimenting with what works in those kind of different cultures and different languages, and we're going to see what people respond to and where people respond to it, and then kind of iterate on that. And so that's something that, that I'm really, really excited about for 2014. Nice. So I have a question for Jen. Yes. Um, something we hear with sponsored content is that there's not enough branding. How do you approach this concern? 
Good question. So at BuzzFeed, we create content, we create posts, and on every post there's about five to seven brand call-outs. So whether it's within the intro copy, we can link out within the intro copy, we have your logo, we have the brand's image, and then we also embed within the post the Facebook and Twitter uh, module so that a user can like your brand uh, right from the post. It's a one-stop social spot, <laughs> really. Um, and so when you think about a banner ad, which only has a small uh, real estate area and it really has one brand call out, the post does a lot more for you. Great. For your brand, yes. Yeah. Nice. So we also have a question from Joanne here. Um, what posts perform best on mobile? Because sometimes GIFs don't always work on mobile. Yeah, I think that's something that, that, um, that that we've been thinking about a huge amount this year because our mobile traffic is sort of, you know, it's more than half of our, our, our uh, sort of desktop traffic. So not thinking about mobile would be a, a, a real mistake for us. And I think something that, that, that in terms of talking to editors is, ha for, for me, is having them always think about mobile as, as you know, how a, a post is going to show up is a big part of that. I do think my experience is that, that, that you know, for instance, like with GIFs, you're, you're going to want to be actively thinking about sort of how long that's going to take to load, and if you're doing an image, you're going to think about sort of how readable it is on mobile. And so I, I am strongly encouraging our editors to think about their, the, to, to remember that they're losing more than half of their audience if they post something that doesn't show up well on mobile. And I think that's going to be more and more true. Yeah. Yeah. No. In general, we like to we like to tell everyone that if it's uh, you can't read it on mobile, it's not worth posting at all. Type of thing. Yeah. Um, because we just get so much traffic from mobile. Yeah, and I th just as one, one other thing about mobile that I that, that is really interesting to me is thinking about mobile from the point of view of content in terms of context, because people are not just at, for instance, at their office, mm -hmm. um, sort of looking at something at their computer. They have more time if it's in the e if you post something in the evening, they might have more time. They might be looking at their iPad in bed. They might be mm -hmm. looking at their iPhone while they're you know waiting in line for something, and kind of thinking about what context people might be looking at your content can in some ways determine the kind of content that you're creating for people. That's great. So since it's the holidays, we're going to give everybody on the line a special gift, the gift of time. So um, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we definitely want to stay in touch, so please use the contact info on this slide to share your thoughts on today's event <laughs> and to find out about future BuzzFeed University events. Uh, we hope you have a wonderful holiday season. Thanks for joining us. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. <laughs> hey.